Well, last week uh, we began uh, that, this series called Liar, Liar, and it's based on this very simple idea that our world is indeed full of lies, and our, our world is one where sin is a part of it and where the devil is often at work, and he tries to get us to believe various lies, even uh, believe things opposite to those beautiful words we just sang, that God is faithful to us all of the time. And so maybe uh, there's various lies we use, things like, uh, I'm late because the traffic was terrible, which doesn't work as well in Marquette, but elsewhere maybe. Uh, It's not you, it's me. That's a famous one. Or I'll start my diet on Monday. Never works out that way. Now those are more simple lies that we might tell, but there are, of course, then those more dangerous lies than those in our world. And that's why we've kind of chosen this theme verse of John 8, 44 through 45, that said, where Jesus says that the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But Jesus says, I tell the truth. And so that's what we're doing. We're taking a look at these lies of the devil and juxtaposing them with the truth that only comes from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And today we take a look then at this lie, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, That's basically then what the people of that day believed, of the day of Rome, that Rome was the center of the world, that you could basically hop on any of the major thoroughfares of the day and you would find yourself in Rome eventually. I can kind of think of this idea a little bit like Chicago. If you've ever looked at a map of Chicago, uh, there are roads everywhere. You could zoom in even further and find uh, a bunch of different ways to get into the core city of Chicago. And then you could contrast that with much of the UP. Uh, Think of the Copper Country, a variety of other places where maybe there's only one road to really get in or out, one major thoroughfare. Or... Uh, We could think of this city of Hackberry, or maybe I should say town of Hackberry, Arizona, that once was a a bustling place because it was on Route 66, but then they built Interstate 40, and that kind of changed all of that, and it became not much of a town at all. Uh, In fact, maybe you're more familiar with Hackberry, Arizona. If I put this up here, Radiator Springs, it's actually uh, based, one of the locations it's based on is Hackberry, Arizona. Arizona. And uh, you can see how there's just one way in and one way out. Not all roads lead to Hackberry, Arizona or Radiator Springs for that matter. So that's what people in Jesus' day then believed. They thought all roads led to Rome because Rome was this major place. But there were also a lot of people both in Jesus' day and in ours that believed this same logic about God. That there are many ways to God, many ways to get to heaven. You just kind of have to pick one. Uh, Even uh, some of the popular voices of our culture, such as Oprah Winfrey, share quotes like this. One of the mistakes human beings make is to believe that there is only one way to live. In other words, you could choose a bunch of different ways. There isn't just one to live your life, and it'll end up in a good place. Even sometimes as Christians, we, we might think this very same way, that we can go to church, that we can strengthen our faith, but at the same time, we, we, we add a little bit of the belief in, in karma, or, or that you can do good deeds, and that'll turn out in some positive fashion for you, even in connection with your faith. Or we might look at certain parts of the Bible and say, well, I don't think that's true in today's world. And so I'm going to kind of pick and choose how I want my faith to be made. Even as Christians then, we're instructed, we're called by Scripture to believe differently. Jesus even says in Matthew chapter 7 that wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to salvation. It's clear then that not all roads lead to God, just as, unfortunately, not all roads led to even Rome in that day, though that was the popular belief. 
And so that's why we're taking a look then at John 14 today to see what Jesus says about this idea of access to God, that there is only one path to God, and also why that's a good thing that we would believe that, that it's not a hindrance or some sort of narrow-minded view that Christians have to see Jesus as the only way. And so we, we basically look then at John 14 as Jesus stakes his claim on the truth. He says, here is the truth for you, as opposed to what everybody of the world in that day and our day believe. And here's how he begins this chapter. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he says to his disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, it's important to understand when Jesus is saying this, because he says this the night before his death. After the Last Supper, after he shared this meal with his disciples, after Judas has betrayed him, many of the things that we just heard about in Holy Week here just a few weeks ago have already occurred. And so it's safe to say Jesus himself is troubled at the thought of going to the cross to die. And yet he still says to his disciples to begin this instruction, don't you be troubled. This is how much Jesus loves his disciples, that he would tell them while he is troubled not to be troubled themselves. But he continues. He he, he adds to this idea. Don't be troubled because you should believe in me just like you believe in God. Put your trust in me because I'm here with you. I am God in the flesh. Put your trust in me and don't be troubled because you do. But then he goes on and he even gives them a reason to trust. Because he says, my father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? He's giving them some, some comfort, a reason to trust what he is saying to them. I want you to notice that word many there because that's that's an incredibly important detail. In fact, in the New Testament, the word many is often used to kind of mean the word all. It's another way of phrasing that. Let me give you a couple of examples. Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. To take away the sins of many. That's everybody. It's intended for all. Mark 10 as well. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, as many as possible, as many as would believe these things. And that's the same logic here in John 14. Jesus is saying to his disciples, hey, look, don't be troubled because there's plenty of room. There's all the room in heaven you could possibly need. The issue isn't going to be you get to heaven, you've lived this great life, and suddenly there's a no vacancy sign. It's not just for a select few. It's for the many. We heard this in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4 as well. God wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. But Jesus doesn't even stop there. Not only are there many rooms, but they're also prepared for you. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Now think of it this way. If you came over to my house, uh, just uh, maybe we're having a get-together of some kind, Uh, we would have cleaned the house, we'd have food set out, things would be ready to go for having guests over to the house. But if you came back a, a completely different day, you're picking something up or just stopping by to say hello, you would very quickly see that kids live in the house, okay? Now, I'm not saying uh, that we have a a messy house, but if you have kids, you know it is impossible to have everything put in its place at all times. And so you would notice that the house is not ready then for gas. There's probably not even food set out. It's just not prepared for somebody to come in and, and, and share some time with you. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's not going to be like somebody coming at 
and it's not prepared. He says, no, don't be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me so that you go to the place that I have prepared for you. Not to that other place, that place of hell that's definitely not what's intended for human beings. No, go to the place I prepared for you. That is heaven, the perfect place, the place that is waiting for you. The place that I will promise you through the cross as I cover up your mess with my blood. Jesus says, I will prepare this place and I will take you there as well. This is the heart of Christ, that he wants to be with us. And more than that, that he actually wants to be with you individually, each and every one of you, because he loves you that much. Just as he says this to his disciples, he says it to us. Don't let your heart be troubled. So much so that he has shared with us the way in the next verse. He says that you know the way to this place I've prepared, this place where I am going. It maybe sets up the biggest question of this entire section. Okay, great. If there's this way, there's this place that's prepared why doesn't everybody want to go there? Well, Jesus lays that out for his disciples as well. He says, look, you've been with me. You've followed me. You have my words. You have my example. You've seen my miracles. You can trust what I am telling you. Therefore, you should know the way to this place. But the disciples don't seem to. Even Thomas himself, he gets a bad rap because he's the doubter, but he just speaks from his heart. He speaks of the things he doesn't understand. So he tells Jesus in the next couple of verses, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answers him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He answers that question of, well, why doesn't everybody know the way? Why don't we know the way, especially as we've been with you? And Jesus gives this salvation 101 lesson. He says, I am the way. Simply trust in me. I am the road, the path, the access, the, the highway to God. I am the way to live according to my word. He says, I am the truth as well. You don't have to worry about which truth is actually truth. There is only one truth. There's not your truth and, and my truth, because if there were a bunch of different truths, then there is no truth. That's how it works. And he says, I am the only life. If you've ever used the phrase, ah, this is the life, and you're hanging out by a bonfire, or you're out down at the beach in the summertime, Jesus says, no, it's not about those temporary pleasures or some kind of weekend getaway. Because I am the way to this place, I am the truth, I am also the access to the life. Eternal life. Life that lasts forever. Very unlike what the world might offer you. But then Jesus closes with this phrase that really gets to that question. Okay, well, why don't... Why doesn't everybody then follow this way? Or maybe the question, isn't this kind of a, a narrow-minded view that there's one possible way? Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the first part of that phrase is a statement of our sinfulness. No one comes to the Father if you stop there, you might be reminded of verses like Isaiah 59. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. No one has access to God. But Jesus finishes with this second part of that statement. That no one comes to the Father except through me. 
In other words, even when we've lost our way, when we haven't followed the direction and guidance that he has given us, he makes an exception for us through Jesus. Now, I was thinking about that idea of an exception, and I actually went back to uh, when we had our son Simeon back in 2020. You probably know the date very well. It was the day that uh, COVID kind of closed everything down, and so we, we had him. I left the hospital to get some food and came back, and uh, there was a security guard that was uh, kind of screening people coming into the hospital. You were not allowed to come in unless you were a patient there, or in other words, you had a good reason to be there. Now, for me, he was kind of asking, well, why, what, what are you doing here? What's, you know, you can't come and visit anybody. And I said, well, my wife and my son are upstairs, so I'd like to go see them. I was a little put off at first, but of course I was allowed to go and see my wife and newborn son. Now, at first I was kind of not liking this new setup, and it was a surprise to me because I didn't expect it. But when I think about it now, and I think about the exception to the rule, the exception was if you have a wife and a son here, you can come in and visit them, even if you're not a patient. Actually, I'd say that exception was good. That exception wasn't exclusive for me. It was inclusive. It was that exception allowed me to come back in and see my wife and son. And that same thing is true of God's exception here. In, in this case, Jesus is your exception. The cross is your exception. And it's then an inclusive thing. To those who simply acknowledge that is the truth, it is a wonderful thing. It gives you salvation. It lets you see God. And suddenly, rather than that being some kind of bad news or some kind of narrow-minded view that it's, there's only one way to get to God, that's good news. Because there once was actually no way at all. And now with this exception, there's a way provided. And can you get a better exception than Jesus? Is there a better exception than God's grace? Is there anything more exceptional than Jesus' love for you and for me? Is there a better way than his free and full forgiveness for you? I can't imagine any. And that's why the way to God, the way to heaven, to the place prepared for you, for me, for the entire world, for that matter, the way is Jesus. He is my way. He is your way. He is the way for the world. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let's close in prayer. God, you are so gracious to us that even when we've messed up, when we've uh, sinned against you, when we've uh, separated ourselves from you in various ways in our lives, you provide us with an exception, with a way in the midst of there being no way, with your free and full forgiveness, with the truth of your word, with the life that nobody could want any more than this, than, than, any more than, than the life you offer us. Lord, we give you thanks for these blessings, your promises to us, and we ask that you would guide us to continue to live and walk in your way, in your truth, in your guidance to the life you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.